जय हिंद नमस्ते हेलो एंड अ वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू यू पी एस सी फॉर एवरी वन माई नेम इज अबिन अब एंड इन दिस वीडियो विल बी डिस्कसिंग सेलेक्टेड टॉपिक्स फ्रॉम द हिंदू एंड इंडियन एक्सप्रेस फॉर द डेट सिक्सटींथ ऑफ अक्टूबर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी नाइन दिस वीडियो विल बी डिस्कसिंग द फॉलोइंग टॉपिक्स फ्रॉम द हिंदू जी एस टी सेंटर टू बोरो फॉर स्टेट सो नाउ सेंटर हैज फाइनली अग्री टू बोरो द शॉर्ट कमिंग्स दैट द स्टेट्स वर फेसिंग फॉर जी एस टी कलेक्शन देन बी ए आर सी सस्पेंड रेटिंग्स ऑफ ऑल न्यूज चैनल्स नो एंड टू वायलेंस अगेंस्ट वेमेन सो SC made some remarks about this there was a particular case in the supreme court so we'll see what are those remarks then supreme court seeks government reply on use of plain english so this is about a plea that has been filed in supreme court and it says that the government notifications government orders everything should come out in plain english so that people are able to understand it so we'll see what this is about then european union imposes sanctions on six russians over navalny attack so we discuss how eu was threatening sanctions and those sanctions are led by R germany and france so finally they have imposed so we'll see what are those sanctions and what is the russian response then kyrgyzstan president resigns to end post election crisis so finally he has resigned then latest stimulus to have minimal growth impact so this is as per moody's so we'll see what moody's is saying about the state of our economy and what kind of an impact this stimulus would have then from the indian express global burden of disease study by lancet so we'll see the top reasons for deaths in india then we'll also see the other factors that are leading to problems and health problems in india then prasar bharti decides to end subscription to pti and uni so we'll see why that happened then ministry of external affairs india to soon deliver myanmar's first submarine so we'll see which submarine is that and why is india doing so then import of air conditioners with refrigerants banned so this was particularly mentioned by our prime minister so india has finally done it so we'll see which is the agency responsible for doing that then the editorials four editorials all from the hindu the message in the peace nobel about multilateralism very good editorial very important points we'll see that then dealing with the deluge it is about the urban floods and the floods in hyderabad so we discussed about the natural causes for flood yesterday today we'll discuss about the human factors that lead to such problems then showdown in thailand so the street protests have been going on in thailand since july so today we'll discuss those protests then road to zero hunger by 2030 another article by representatives of fao in india and this is also about food security this is also about the challenges india faces in the light of covid and climate change what india is doing what more needs to be done so we'll see and for your convenience i have also added time stamp in the description so if you want to scroll to a particular news just click on that and you'll be there and also please join our telegram channel for free pdf of this video so without further delays let's get started the message in peace nobel multilateralism so this editorial is from the hindu and this has been written by mr sham saran who was of ex foreign secretary important points he has made the overall theme is that the nobel prize for world food program has again highlighted the importance of multilateralism in the world now first he tells us that this covid-19 has spurred a competition among countries now at a time when there was increasing need for global cooperation and collaboration the reverse has happened that cross national and global challenges have increased now he says that covid-19 recognizes no national or regional boundaries yes and that has led to a race vaccine nationalism i have told you time and again that who makes the vaccine first and who gets access to the vaccine first so this is the background that is given then he talks about the looming food crisis he says that wfp's achievements are modest not because it is inefficient but because it is perennially underfunded if you remember i told you there is a gap of 4.1 billion dollars of funding so the message that this award is trying to send across is that the world should come together and there is an increasing need to grow multilateralism as an expression of international solidarity now there is also a warning we have read reports that this pandemic has reversed the substantial gains that were made in the fight against poverty if you remember world bank had said 150 million more and imf 90 million more would come into extreme poverty 1.90 dollars a day if you remember we have discussed all of this now wfp says 132 million more would also be malnourished because of this pandemic and already 690 million people go to bed on empty stomachs now 100 million more would be added to this list so this is going to be a major worldwide catastrophe again there is a need that world country should come together so this nobel will hopefully nudge for collective consensus to come together relieve the looming humanitarian crisis 
Now he says that at 75 UN is still important because many observers and many analysts have said that multilateralism is dead now there is regionalism and there is also isolationism in international relations but mr saran says that un is still relevant now he says the problems in un are because of the powerful member countries they have deprived the un of resources and they have resisted the efforts to institute long overdue reforms like expansion of unsc and india's membership to that and that has been seriously resisted and we've discussed all of that now he says that despite all these problems un is more than ever now an essential part of fabric of international relations its role has become more important because the global problems are increasing and india has always been a consistent advocate of multilateralism now he also tells us about the multiple institutions that are there in the un so there is a structure there is a network of multilateral institutions and then intergovernmental organizations right this enables governance in areas which require coordination and set norms to regulate behavior to avoid conflict and to ensure equitable burden sharing and equally a fair distribution of benefits so this is the whole purpose of the structure now going forward this structure may have worked for the past 75 years now going forward in the light of new challenges we need to have a different mindset and we need to evolve new patterns of behavior and evolve this structure now he says that in international relations the approach has always been to concede as little as possible and extract as much as you can but that leads to problem because this might work for trade or security matters but this won't work for global challenges like climate change or the current pandemic he has rightly pointed that out then he says that globalization is here to say people are saying that globalization is dead but because of pandemic the digital economy has become more relevant and till the time the digital economy is there globalization will always be there so there is no need to say that globalization is dead in fact globalization is becoming stronger in a new form then he says that in light of all these things we need a new approach old approach was take as much as possible now the new approach should be to contribute as much as possible within the limitation of resources and demand minimum in terms of assess needs so it is more about giving and cooperating with the international community than looking out for your own interest this is what he is saying so he says this is the new vision of international solidarity that the globalized world requires now now he also tells that domestic imperatives cannot be solved without international cooperation he gives the example of climate change and again the pandemic for both of them we need global cooperation to come at solid solutions then he talks about the threat in challenges that all the challenges are interconnected for example he gives example of food energy and water security he says that if we have more food energy it could be detrimental to our water security and our energy security how so for raising crop yields with current agriculture strategies we need higher incremental use of chemical fertilizer and toxic pesticides now that would seriously impact the health security yes or no and similarly that would lead to more extraction of groundwater so depletion of groundwater would also be there and the more you use pumps for groundwater the more energy depletion there is so these problems are interconnected and he gives a very important point that india's unprotected farmers are exposed to these serious health risks and more often than not they commit suicide not because of bankruptcy but because of debil <coughs> debilitating health costs so he says that it is in recognition of these interconnections that sdgs were announced and these sdgs are cross domain and cross national and they demand greater multilateral cooperation in order to succeed and he finally makes a point that we need a more democratic world order because even if one member refuses to cooperate then it can or it could frustrate success in tackling global challenges so these are all the points that he has made i have given you an overview you can download the pdf and then you can read it in your leisure time the road to zero hunger by 2030 now this editorial is again from the hindu and this is also about food security and the problem of global hunger the main theme is to eradicate food insecurity and achieve sustainable development goal 2 which is zero hunger by 2030 now this editorial is india specific it tells us about the problems to food security and sdg2 because of covid and climate change that india faced and then it also tells us what india has done and what are the challenges for india to achieve sdg2 right so let us see so first some important points that 
This year in 2020, FAO is celebrating its 75 years. The International Fund for Agriculture Development has become the first UN agency to receive a credit rating and the World Food Programme has received Nobel Peace Prize. Now importance of food that it is essence of life, it is the bedrock of cultures and communities, it is a powerful means to bring people together to grow, nourish and sustain the planet. But COVID-19 poses a threat to food security and agricultural livelihoods compounds the threats already faced by 690 million people. We have discussed this so many times, right? Now, first of all, it says that much has been done for SDG 2, but much more needs to be done. Please forgive this typo, much more, right? So, first of all, agricultural productivity has improved significantly, yes, but sadly, 2 billion people globally still lack access to sufficient, nutritious and safe food. And these are the bedrocks of food security as well. It should be sufficient, it should be nutritious and it should be safe. So everybody knows that we are not on track to achieve the target of zero hunger by 2030 and we won't be able to meet the global nutrition targets. Now coming to India. Now India has made tremendous success. India has gone from being a net importer to net exporter of food grains. Now during this pandemic, both the central and state governments were able to distribute around 23 million tons of food grains to the people through our large domestic food grain reserves using the large network of PDFs. Government successfully mobilized food ra rations for 820 million people and including finding alternative solutions to provide ration to 90 million school children who were getting ration in different schemes like midday meal scheme. Agriculture also grew at 3.4% in the first quarter of this financial year and the area under the Kharif exceeded 110 million hectares. So this is a major achievement. Now this is not something that government of India is saying. These are the representatives of FAO in India. They have written this editorial. Now it points out that despite all this improvement, there is still malnutrition and anemia in India. So even as malnutrition in India has mostly declined over the past decade, the Comprehensive National Nutrition Survey 2016-18. to 18. See, such surveys you can quote, so please make a point that you enter this survey in your notes. Over 40 million children chronically malnourished and more than half of Indian women 15 to 49 years are anemic. So this is the condition despite having so much food and this is not just endemic to India. We saw that globally we have made so much progress in food grain production yet more than 2 billion people do not have access to food. Now in India initiatives such as ICDS, we have discussed that 6 months to 6 years right and children get cooked meals or take home ration. So 100 million children are getting access to that as well as pregnant and lactating mothers and midday meal scheme programs. They are stellar examples of how government is working to fix these challenges of food insecurity, right? But climate change has a very big impact on food security. It poses a real and potent threat to agrobiodiversity and will impact everything from productivity to livelihoods. Now, India is dealing with this problem innovatively. How? Through development of drought and flood tolerant seed varieties, weather based agricultural advisories promotion of millets and small scale irrigation. This is also known as micro irrigation. So these are the steps that India is taking to counter climate change and its deleterious effects on food security and agriculture, right? This year we saw how climate related shocks can seriously impede our agriculture. We saw pest attacks, then locust attacks, as well as floods and cyclones. And in India, the intensified food production systems with excessive use of chemicals and unsustainable farming practices are causing soil degradation, fast depletion of groundwater table and rapid loss of agrobiodiversity. So these are the problems, some problems and some solutions. Now there's also a very big problem of land fragmentation and they have given beautiful figures. Please make sure that you note these figures. So these challenges multiply with an increase in fragmentation of land holdings. Now what happens when there is fragmentation of land holdings, the overall productivity of land decreases and that is not good in the long term. In India, more than 86% of farmers have less than 2 hectares of land, but they contribute around 60% of total food grain production and over half of country's fruits and vegetables. So very important figure that more than 86% farmers, less than 2 hectares, but contribute around 
60 percent of food grain production and over half of fruits and vegetables all this points to two undeniable imperatives number one the way we produce food must change through agroecology and sustainable production practices in agriculture and allied sectors and second we must stop the waste one third of the food we produce is wasted so this is very important and we have been taking steps for example we discussed kisan rail right trains with refrigerated systems and easy transportation of food grains and fruits and vegetables to the destination and reduction in wastage right so such steps are important and on our own and at the consumer end we should also try and not waste food right and then this editorial also gives us a concept of food system that what is food system it is a framework that includes every aspect of feeding and nourishing people growing harvesting processing to packaging transporting marketing and consuming food so basically farm to fork right from the growing part to your plate so everything is considered under this food system and this food system should be sustainable and it should minimize wastage now to be sustainable a food system must provide enough nutritious food for all without compromising feeding future generations that is the whole concept of sustainability so it applies to food system as well as countries begin to develop and implement covid-19 recovery plan it is also an opportunity to adopt innovative solutions based on scientific evidence so they can build back better and make food systems more resilient so see whenever there are shocks whenever there is a problem there is also an opportunity so this problem in the form of covid-19 has also brought an opportunity for us to reflect on the practices that we are undertaking and make appropriate changes so that in future when there are such shocks and there will be such shocks we should be better prepared so this is all about this editorial india to soon deliver myanmar's first submarine so now india is trying to revive its relations with its neighbors if you remember we discussed how our foreign secretary and the army chief they went to myanmar for a two day visit and myanmar is sort of having a break up with china and same is happening in bangladesh as well bangladesh is also trying to somewhat isolate itself from the chinese debt diplomacy right so now we are going to deliver a kilo class submarine ins sindhu v2 myanmar navy and this will be myanmar's first submarine now this step is in line with india sagar which is security and growth for all in the region initiative and its commitment to building capacities in the neighborhood so this is your sort of homework you should do your own research that what is sagar it is a very simple topic that is why i am not covering it here gst center to borrow for states so there has been a tussle between center and states over the gst dues then center told them that the gst law does not cover act of god they said that uh, this pandemic is an act of god and we are not legally mandated to compensate you for the losses because of the pandemic then they gave some options to the state to borrow but then states said that they cannot directly borrow because if states go for direct borrowing from the market they would be having access to loans at a higher rate of interest so they asked the center to take the loans on their behalf first center rejected now center has accepted that so the 1.1 lakh crore question 21 states had agreed to borrow from market to meet gst shortfalls now center will borrow and lend to the states this may help lowering borrowing costs for states with higher deficits government of india will now undertake the required borrowings in tranches and pass them on to states as back to back loans that will reflect on their own books the move may help break the impasses between center and the states see if you talk about credit rating the government of india is a more credible source right so government of india would be having access to loans at a cheaper rate see this is the law of finance the riskier the investment loan or anything it will have a higher return and the stable the investment it will have a lower return but why would anybody want to invest in stability because it is a sure return greater probability of getting your assets back <clears throat> so if there is a loan lender if he has to choose between center and states he would prefer the center right and if he has to give to the states the rate of interest will be higher so states were saying the same thing and now center has accepted that showdown in thailand again this is from the hindu now since july students in thailand have been protesting against the government and now finally the government has imposed emergency there so now it is a right time to discuss this issue so we'll discuss this issue 
through various sections first we'll look at the background that what is the background then what triggered the protests then what do the protesters want how are they challenging the monarchy how are they inspired by popular culture and the violent suppressions in the past that have taken place in thailand and finally what now is going to happen right so let us start so first of all background since july they have been protesting in the streets protests largely driven by students and young people thai government issued emergency decree banning public gatherings and censoring the media so under the new rules people cannot gather in numbers of 5 or more and publication of news is also banned which could lead to creation of fear in the people now they can also prohibit people from entering any area they designate so people cannot basically come together in areas for protest right so from july the students have been protesting against the authoritarian government of prime minister prayuth cha ocha and they have grown into a large political movement and they have also been raising challenges to the government and also the monarchy and institution that historically has been protected from public criticism by tough lessi majesty laws and under these laws people can be incarcerated in prison for up to 15 years but the king has asked the prime minister for some time to not apply this law the lessi majesty laws right so this is the background of this now what triggered the protests so mr prayuth he came to power in 2014 through a military coup then last year there was an election and it was a disputed election he won that and he has been backed by the king and he has been tightening his grip on power and crack down on dissent and in 2017 he brought out a new constitution that saw democracy being seriously eroded so this gradual erosion of political rights and the outbreak of covid-19 plus the related economic woes triggered the protests so this is the reason why the protests are happening now so this has been brewing from 2014 finally culminating in 2020 now what do the protesters want they have earned the support of large sections of society they are now calling for prime minister's resignation free and fair elections a new constitution that guarantees democratic rights and they also want to seriously clip the powers of the monarchy and the king because king has wide powers first of all he is not present in the country only most of the times he is in europe he is living a life of luxury but these people are facing hardships and the king has access to all the royal fortunes so people say that it is the property of the people of thailand not the king because thailand is not a monarchy anymore <coughs> so they want that king's hold over the country should be lessened king also controls some of the sections of the army so that is a dangerous thing now challenge to monarchy the thai monarchy lost absolute powers in 1932 revolution but still it has managed to maintain its high influence in government and got like status in society now protesters are openly challenging the king he came to the throne in 2016 now under the lesser majesty laws the criticism of monarchy is punishable up to 15 years i've already told you but the king had asked the prime minister that they should not be enforced for now now the protesters want that the king's role should be clearly subjected to constitution the new constitution that would be formed and they seek the reversal of orders that gave him control over the palace fortunes and some army units because he is still living a life of luxury inspired by popular culture so what happened there was a royal motorcade and the students they gave a three finger salute which is a symbol of resistance taken from the hunger games trilogy it's a trilogy of books and also movies have been made about it and earlier the students were also dressed like harry potter during the protest so these are the new kinds of protests this can also be an important point or important topic for your paper one that new forms of protests are evolving and if you remember supreme court also made some observations about the new age protests during its shaheen bag judgment right so there are new evolving forms some are good some are bad then we also saw new forms of protest being employed in hong kong so we have to understand all of this is it it is important for your paper one and for people who are preparing for sociology they have a particular topic in their syllabus that protest and movement so this can be applied there as well what now the king who is mostly in europe and mr prayuth they have become symbols of extravagance the king and operation the prime minister for the protesters they have dismissed the emergency and they say that the protest has gone past the point of no return and this will finally lead to a showdown with the police now there has been violent suppression in the past 
In 1976, police and right-wing thugs massacred protesters in Thammasat University, Bangkok. So let's hope this does not happen again and there is a peaceful solution. Nobody would want to see. But then again, this is not 1976, this is 2020. Let's hope that this problem gets resolved soon. European Union imposes sanctions on six Russians over Navalny attack. So we discussed this earlier, I think, day before yesterday. This proposition for the sanction was spearheaded by France and Germany, right? And the issue is that in Navalny's body, traces of Novichok were formed, right? Novichok is the Soviet era banned chemical nerve agent that was used on him. So they have now finally come out with the sanctions. <laughs> what happened that they threatened Russia with sanctions and then Russia threatened them with countermeasures. Now, basically, these sanctions would lead to freezing of assets and travel bans in Europe. So some of the highest ranked officials and straight research institute over the nerve agent poisoning of Russian opposition leader Navalny because this institute was supposed to check the use of Novichok. The move comes a day after Russia's foreign minister threatened the 27 nation EU with retaliatory action. The sanctions consist of asset freeze and travel bans. Now what has been Russia's response? They said that this move is a deliberate unfriendly step towards Russia and that EU inflicted damage on the bloc's relations with Russia. So let's see now where it goes. They are trying to mess with Mr. Putin. and But Mr. Putin does not take things lying down. Dealing with the deluge. So this is again about the floods that are happening in Hyderabad, Telangana and Karnataka. Now yesterday we discussed why this is happening. We discussed tropical cyclones. So see, for urban floods, there are two parts. One is the nature part, right? which is not in our hand. Other is the man-made or the human factor, which is in our hand. And these urban floods are largely because of our actions. For example, we have disturbed the natural flow route of rainwater. So that water gets accumulated. Then we have disturbed the hydro ecology of the region. Then again, it leads to the problem of floods. Then the sewage systems that we use, they are outdated. They are not capable enough to handle such a big deluge and then we have increasingly encroached upon wetlands now these wetlands are very very important they provide a very important cushion against flood problems so these all things we have taken away so it is but natural that there would be floods and more so in the urban areas right so this editorial tells us about this problem only we know the natural causes we have discussed yesterday now we will understand the human causes so let us look at it so a deep monsoon depression over the west central bay of Bengal, which weakened as it moved over Telangana, resulted in downpours over several districts in the state, severely affecting the city of Hyderabad as well. According to Indian Meteorological Department, highest rainfall for October since 1903, right? We have discussed everything yesterday. Now the reasons for disaster, the human reasons or the man-made reasons. Number one, overflowing of lakes. Much of the damage was done due to overflowing of lakes, in particular the Hussein Sagar Lake in the middle of the city and breaching of storm water drain. So what happens that water is drained into such lakes, so they are already overflowing with their capacity and then this flood water and the rain water gets added to it and it leads to a flood because it has a particular capacity to hold water. Second, construction and encroachment. Construction over lake beds and encroachments of drainage channels have been identified as problems that have excavated flooding and inundation in city in the past. So this is not only the case with Hyderabad, same you can apply for Delhi, same you can apply for Chennai and most importantly you can apply the same for Mumbai which is the worst affected city in our country when it comes to urban floods. Antiquated sewage and drainage system. Little has been done to unblock existing storm drains over the last decade and not enough has been done to handle the requirement of the city, which still depends upon antiquated sewerage and drainage system. Again, these are problems that are generic to every city in our country. And loss of wetlands, besides lakes and canals, wetlands and watersheds play a vital role in absorbing excess rainfall, but regrettably rapid urbanization in the Twin Cities has resulted in loss of large portion of the wetland. So this is same everywhere. Loss of wetland there in Mumbai, Chennai, antiquated sewerage, again Mumbai, Chennai, Delhi, loss of wetland also in Delhi, construction and encroachment, you see Akshardham temple and other structures on Yamuna bed and that leads to problem of flooding there as well. 
Now, this is only one problem that is not in some cities that overflowing of lakes that because not many cities have lakes, but these other problems are generic and they're common. So you can apply them everywhere. So important topic. Now, urban floods is important both for your paper one and also for your paper three. Paper one is about geography and paper three is about disaster management. So you need to cover this topic thoroughly. Now, what is the conclusion? He says that in the long term, the effects of flooding due to deluges can only be mitigated if urban planners take into account the hydrogeology of cities and ensure that construction development and land occupation do not take place in a way that reduces the area of wetland. So it is about intelligent urban planning and not encroaching upon the wetlands, the riverbeds and also the natural drainage paths of rivulets and other types of drain water. So this is important. Latest stimulus to have minimal growth impact. This is as per Moody's. So Moody's recently downgraded India in July from BAA2 to BAA3. These are both in negative territory, the credit ratings for India. And it has also said that around 11.5% our GDP would be going down. And they say that the measures that have been taken till now to boost the economy, they only constitute 1.2% of the total GDP as compared to other similarly ranked countries which have put up to 2.5% of their GDP into the pandemic related relief measures. And the latest one is only 0.2% of GDP and it would lead to probably a 0.5% jump in GDP. So they are saying that this is not enough. As a matter of fact, Moody says that this small scale has a negative credit impact because it shows that country does not have or the country has limited budgetary firepower to support the economy. Now Moody expects India's GDP to shrink to 11.5% in 2021. So the 0.5% of GDP gain expected by government from these stimulus measures will provide only a small boost, it pointed out. The package amounts to a fiscal cost of 0.2% of real GDP this year. In total, the two rounds of stimulus bring the government's direct spending on coronavirus related fiscal support to around 1.2% of GDP. But the similarly rated economies, they have spent around or invested about 2.5% of GDP, the BAA related peers as of mid-June. And they came up with the figures of average fiscal stimulus of 13 B. AA rated nations from the IMF's database, right? India's rating is BAA3 negative as per Moody's following a downgrade this June from BAA2 negative. Now it also says there would be a rebound about 10.6% in 21-22 but that would be due to low base effect and the gradual normalization would be in the economic activities, right? Then the growth would settle to around 6% over medium term. And they say that this downside is not only just because of the COVID, but the problem that was there before the COVID as well. So this is what the Moody's has said about India's economy and the relief measures that have been announced. No end to violence against women as per Supreme Court. So there was a case and then Supreme Court made some remarks. So let us see what the court has said. The Supreme Court said crimes against women continued in a never ending cycle in India. What were the observations? Women in India faced violence and discrimination in one form or the other in their various roles as daughter, sister, wife, mother, partner or single woman. So no woman is safe. The Supreme Court quoted that the 2005 law against domestic harassment was a milestone. Now it says that domestic violence continues to be the least reported form of violence towards women. Why? Because women continue to be vulnerable because of non-retaliation coupled with absence of law addressing their rights and ignorance of the existing statutes. Social attitudes, stigma and conditioning also made women vulnerable to domestic violence. So this is important for your paper one and also for someone who's preparing for sociology. Also, relationships outside marriage were not recognized. This set of circumstances ensured that a majority of women preferred to suffer in silence not out of choice, but out of compulsion. So this is the problem. And the court finally said that the progress of any society dependent on its ability to protect and promote the rights of women. So this is a very important point, right? So this is what the court has said. And these are very good points. And these are practical points that the Supreme Court has made. Supreme Court seeks government reply on use of plain English. Now, this is important. 
you can apply this for topics like transparency accountability and governance reforms so what happens if you've ever had the pleasure of reading any of the government notifications the english is so hard there it's like mumbo jumbo right you won't be able to understand it it's, it's a particular kind of language same happens for the judgments of the court you won't be able to understand it quickly because the words they are framed in such a manner that they do not strike a chord with the normal population and same happens during the court proceedings the lawyers they go on rambling and rambling and they waste the time of the court so now someone has filed a plea for using plain english for drafting laws government orders and notifications to make them digestible for the public and it is very very important because see if any law comes out you should be able to understand it not only should it be in plain english but it should also be in your own vernacular language right so that should be the next step but this would be a good beginning point to come out with such notification laws etc in plain english see basically they are formulated in complex language just to beat the public to beat around the issues of transparency and accountability so the bench led by chief justice of india issued notice to the government on a petition the petitioner also wants a new course of study in law colleges called legal writing in plain english so that the law students they also understand that they should be able to write in plain english not the convoluted terms right the petitioner also asked the oral arguments of lawyers in court should not be rambling but made to the point so that court gets time for all and not an elite few so this is important let us see how it goes it is very very important in terms of transparency accountability and also people's participation in governance processes barc suspends ratings of all news channels so in the light of the trp scam barc has decided that it will be suspending the ratings for the next 3 months both the audience estimates and the ratings of all news channels that it will cover all hindi regional and english news and business news channels with immediate effect Kyrgyzstan president resigns to end post election crisis so i think we have discussed kyrgyzstan twice or thrice already two times in details right so i won't be getting into that so now mr soronboy jean bekov he has resigned saying that he wanted to bring an end to the crisis right what was happening and avoid the further bloodshed and during this protest there was little resistance protesters met little resistance as they sprang prominent figures from jail including populist figure head sadar japarov who has been declared a pm now right so this is what is happening right now in kyrgyzstan top risk factors for death in india so this is according to global burden of disease study by lancet and they came out with it recently so we will be discussing this in two parts one is from the hindu and then when i go to the articles from the indian express the other part i'll be telling you from that so they have identified top 5 risks air pollution blood pressure tobacco use poor diet and blood sugars these are the deaths that are related to these problems right now they are saying that non communicable diseases they are rising now non communicable diseases are basically your lifestyle related diseases like sugar hypertension diabetes etc so 58% of total disease burden is now due to non communicable diseases up from 29% in 1990 right with premature deaths due to non communicable diseases have more than double from 22 to 50 percent this is because people do not take care of their health anymore life is more relaxed for them and more exposure to processed food so that is causing this problem gains in life expectancy but despite that india has gained more than a decade of life expectancy since 1990 but again the problem is that the added years are the years of sickness where people are dependent on medicines and their health parameters are not that good now some articles from the indian express so we have already discussed the first part of this right now we'll be discussing the second part so in india air pollution and high blood pressure among the top 5 risks for death in 2019 study in lancet that study is global burden of disease and it will be published soon now interaction of covid-19 with continued global rise in chronic illness and related risk factors including obesity high blood sugar and outdoor air pollution over the past 30 years has created a perfect storm according to this report and that is fueling covid deaths the leading non communicable causes of death in india in 2019 was ischemic heart disease followed by chronic obstructive pulmonary disease stroke and cirrhosis and other chronic liver diseases 
the leading risk factor for total health loss in India was child and maternal malnutrition, while the second leading risk factor was air pollution. So again, malnutrition, air pollution, and we've already discussed so much about food security and malnutrition already in this video. Now, according to the report, we've discussed this 58% of total disease burden is from non-communicable diseases and death rate has doubled. India has gained more than a decade of life expectancy rising from 59.6 years to 70.8. Now, the range varies according to states. However, has not been as dramatic as growth of life expectancy. So people are living more years with illness and disability, I told you. Since 1990, India has made substantial gains in health. But child and maternal malnutrition is still the top risk factor for illness and death in India, contributing to more than 20% of the total disease burden in several states in northern India. So this is about this article. Then the next, we have discussed this already. Then this one. Prasar Bharti decides to end subscription to PTI and UNI. So just you need to know that Prasar Bharti earlier used to pay them. But since 2006, there was no formal contract and it basically decided to do so because PTI, the press trust of India, it interviewed the Chinese ambassador to India, despite Prasar Bharti telling them not to. And then the Chinese embassy published the truncated version of it on its website. And the same they did with the Hindu Hindu gloriously placed Chinese ads on its front page and then Chinese websites were flashing those ads and they were saying that Indian people love China. So these press people, they don't have any credibility. Nobody is a saint. Everybody, some is playing for one side, some is playing for the other, but everybody is in it for money and everybody is working for vested interests. Then a small news related to Atmanirbha program. So import of air conditioners with refrigerants banned in India. So India will no longer be able to import air conditioners with refrigerants as government banned their imports. India's campaign to be self-reliant by promoting domestic manufacturing of such goods. Again, there is a China angle and which is the agency that does that? Directorate General of Foreign Trade, DGFT, which is coming out with this notification. So for banning anything, it is the DGFT. Non-essential electronic goods have been under the purview of Ministry of Commerce and Industry since the government decided to push for self-reliance in various sectors this year. And Mr. Modi, he made a specific point, singled out the air conditioners as an example of a segment where self-reliance was required. We import more than 30% of our domestic demand for air conditioners, so we need to work on that. In July, government imposed restrictions on imports of various color TV sets as well. So these are all the measures that will spur domestic players to come up with products to cater to our domestic markets and it will help to boost production in our domestic sectors. So folks, that is all for this video. Thank you for watching. If you like our videos, please subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new videos that we post. Also, if you like our video, please give us a thumbs up. And please do connect with us on our Instagram page, UPSC for everyone. So see you next time. Till then, stay happy, stay safe and have a great day. Namaste and Jai Hind.